All right, welcome everybody uh, to what's new in energy efficiency finance, which is part of the 2020 Better Buildings, Better Plants Virtual Leadership Symposium. This is Joe Invic here, and boy, do we have a packed house today. Kyle, if you go to the next slide. Um, we've got about 1,600 people registered for this session, which tells me that you all are as excited to dive into recent trends in energy efficiency finance as we all are. If you're a fellow uh, clean energy finance nerd, then you're in good company. And if you're relatively new to some of these concepts, then you're, you're also in good company because we're going to try to start from square one on a lot of this and, and make it as digestible as possible. So welcome. Um, for those of us you know, who have been working in clean energy finance for, for a while, it's kind of remarkable to look back on the last 10 years and, and think about how far we've come. We've seen the advent of many new financial products during that period that are making it easier than ever for commercial building owners to get access for the capital that they need uh, for energy retrofits. Uh, and in fact, all three of the major financing options we're going to be talking about today uh, were essentially invented in the last 10 years, and many of them have sort of come into their prime just in the last few years. So I think everybody here knows that we face a monumental challenge when it comes to uh, realizing kind of the full energy savings potential of the built environment in the U.S. economy. We know from studies by McKinsey and other groups that the opportunity is something to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars of high ROI projects, if not more. Um, and, you know, it's been really interesting to kind of see how the financing industry has risen to the challenge of addressing that, that market need uh, and providing an ever increasing arsenal of clean energy financing tools ranging from, excuse me, ranging from kind of traditional financing solutions to more innovative solutions, which we're going to be focused on today. So before we dive in, um, there's a, just a couple of housekeeping points that I want to cover. Please note that today we are going to be recording and archiving this on the Better Building Solutions Center. Uh, we're going to follow up when today's recording and slides are made available. And then attendees are going to be in listen only mode today. So your microphones will be muted. If you experience any audio or visual issues anytime throughout the session, just go ahead and send a message in your chat window in the, in the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, and our technical team will hopefully get you taken care of. So again, just to introduce myself again, my name is Joe Invic and I'll be moderating today. Um, I'm the head of clean energy finance at Retech Advisors and along with Kyle Saltzman, who is running the slides today. Uh, we lead the Better Buildings financing sector and the Financial Allies Network. And I'm really excited, I think both of us are, to see so many folks joining to learn about recent trends in clean energy finance. Thank you all for, for making the time to hear from our speakers today. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we've got a, a pretty action-packed agenda for you today. I'm going to briefly introduce the state of the energy finance industry in 2020 and the current landscape of energy financing options. Um, then I'm going to hand it over to our speakers who are going to talk through three of the most rapidly growing financing solutions that are sort of making waves in the commercial building sector. And those are commercial pace, efficiency as a service, and green bonds. And then we're going to have a lot of time, probably about 30 minutes for Q&A at the end of the session. But if you go to the next slide, uh, the main takeaway I want you to have here is a practical understanding of innovative financing tools that you can bring back to your organizations to get more energy retrofits done. We're going to talk a little bit about the research and a little bit about the principles here, but ultimately we want this to be actionable and practicable for you uh, in getting, getting projects across the finish line. If you go to the next slide, um, we're really excited to announce that we're using Slido, an interactive platform for Q&A and polling. So please right, right now, either in a web browser or on your mobile phone, if you haven't done this already for the other, uh, for the other presentations, go to slido.com and then you'll be prompted to enter an event code. The code is BB Summit. And when you enter that event code, you're gonna see a dropdown for different sessions. You wanna select this session. So that's what's new in energy efficiency finance. And if you wanna ask our panelists questions at any point throughout this presentation, please go ahead and submit them through Slido. We'll be answering them at the end, but you can ask them anytime. Um, I'm gonna give everybody a couple of minutes to get Slido up and running. Again, go to www.slido.com, uh, enter the code BBSummit, and then select what's new in energy efficiency finance. And to get started, um, we're gonna do a quick poll on what sector you're joining us from. So it looks like folks are already filling this out. If you'd please go ahead and fill it out now. What sector are you joining us from? Okay, we still got a bunch rolling in here. It looks like contractors and service providers are pretty high on the list. We got a bunch of others, a fair number of local governments, state governments, folks from the financial services industry. Um, Kyle, would you scroll down a little bit and see what some of the others are saying? 
got uh, okay, a happy few from the data center crowd, higher education, commercial buildings, a little bit from K-12 schools, nonprofits. So pretty much all the major sectors and better buildings covered. It's great to, great to have you all with us today. Um, some of the other categories we're seeing, healthcare, technology, federal government folks, uh, energy services companies, et cetera. Great, so good to have you with us all, uh, all with us today. Uh, if you want to go back to the next slide. Uh, there we go. Uh, so we'll hope that you all can join us on social media as well um, around having a conversation around the 2020 summit. Uh, you can do that on both Twitter and LinkedIn at the links and handles that you see here. And remember again, if you're having any issues, technically speaking with the webinar, um, please message our tech support team by just using the chat function in your Zoom panel and we'll get you taken care of. All right, if you wanna get smart on trends in energy finance, you are definitely in the right room. We've got a fantastic panel of folks who quite frankly been in the trenches driving a lot of the energy finance innovation that I was talking about over the last few years. I'm really excited to have all three of them here. So we've got Rachel Davis who leads business development and originations for Petros Pace Finance. Petros provides financing to mid-size and large PACE projects ranging from 500,000 to over 200 million each and has closed transactions in 12 states. We've got Edwin Luevanos, who's the CEO and co-founder of Citizen Energy, an efficiency as a service company headquartered here in Washington, DC. Uh, and they actually joined the Better Buildings Challenge as a financial ally just this last year. So welcome to Edwin and his team. And then we have Greg Montgomery, who's the managing director at Clean Source Capital, who has experience designing and administering green bond programs for literally as long as green bonds have been around since 2014. And before we dive into the weeds on any one financing solution, I wanna just take a minute and review the basics of energy project finance with you, for those of you in particular who are starting from square one. So typically, if you wanna advance the slide, Kyle, um, when we're looking at doing an energy retrofit in a commercial building, You'll typically have a financing provider, a bank, a lender, et cetera, and a customer could be, it could be the owner, the operator, or the occupant, depending on how it's structured. The financing provider puts up the capital to fund the project, and the customer repays the financing provider over time. That financing provider is typically raising its capital from a set of investors and or potentially putting up some capital itself. And then if you advance the slide once more, the customer is, of course, working with the contractor to execute the installation which could either be done through the financing provider or working directly with the contractor. So that's basically it, right? Uh, that pretty much all the financial structures we're gonna be talking about follow that basic model. So don't lose the forest for the trees if you're, if you're new to some of this stuff. We're gonna talk, be throwing around a lot of terminology, a lot of different repayment mechanisms and structured finance approaches, but ultimately this is at the core of everything that we're talking about today. So if you go to the next slide, um, one other thing that folks kind of often struggle to get their heads around is, is what are all the financing options that are out there and how do they compare it to each other? And I think this is a really helpful way to kind of cut through the fog and make sense of that. So this diagram here is how we at the Department of Energy think about the landscape of energy financing solutions. You've got within energy efficiency and renewable energy finance, you've got traditional financing, things like leases and loans that are used for many other purposes in the economy, of course, but can also be deployed to do energy projects. And then you have specialized financing vehicles. So these are solutions specifically designed for efficiency and renewables. Things like on-bill financing, where the customer repays on their utility bill, property assessed clean energy, where the customer repays on their property tax bill, and various flavors of energy services, including efficiency as a service, which is an off-balance sheet performance-based solution for efficiency projects, energy savings performance contracts, which are typically larger scale, engagements where an energy services company will come in and do a series of retrofits in, in a group of buildings and power purchase agreements which uh, are an off balance sheet solution for uh, uh, third party ownership of renewable energy generation on site. So if you'd advance the slide, um, the three financing options we're going to be talking about in more detail today are these three commercial pace which Rachel's going to talk about uh, efficiency as a service. Edwin's going to talk about. And then we put green bonds in the internal funding category uh, because it's a way to, it's often used as a way to capitalize a company at the corporate level to then use for, uh, for sustainability purposes. But you could just as easily put it under loans because it really is a form of borrowing money from investors as well. So those are the three we're focusing on. Um, why are we focusing on those three? If you go to the next slide, 
uh, I think it'll become pretty evident upon looking at these three graphs. Um, so all three of these financing options have experienced, frankly, meteoric growth in volume uh, and deals done over the last few years. First one here, is this from Pace Nation? And, and Rachel's gonna talk more about this in her presentation. Uh, we've seen a pretty significant, what is that, a quadrupling of activity just in the last few years on commercial Pace, and the projections are that it will continue to increase going forward, and that goes for residential Pace as well. Uh, going to the next one, this is a study done by Navigant Research that was, uh, that was kind of discussed and, and uh, presented by Green Tech Capital Providers, which shows the anticipated size of the energy as a service market. Now that's not efficiency as a service, that's a kind of a superset of efficiency as a service. It includes some other stuff too. But the, the takeaway here, this is actually billions of dollars per year on the y-axis, is that energy as a service could become a $200 billion a year plus industry by 2026, according to Navigant. Uh, and going to the final, graph. This is green bond deployment or green bond issuances, I should say, since 2014. Again, starting from, from basically not existing in 2013 to over $250 billion in global issuances uh, of green bonds uh, in 2019. So significant growth in all three of these areas. Um, these, these three products are increasingly becoming sort of household names, if you will, in the commercial building industry. Uh, and I think there's many aspects of them that even if you've heard about them before will potentially surprise you, uh, which we're going to talk about today. All right, moving on to the next slide. Um, before we get into the individual financial products, I wanna touch on another topic that is, is a pretty big emerging trend, and that is the financial implications of climate and resilience risk on, the, on commercial buildings, right? There's been a, a pretty substantial spike in climate and weather related disasters over the last few years, uh, with building owners kind of understandably scrambling to understand how to get a handle on resilience and particularly how it's gonna impact the energy and financial performance of their properties. And for that reason, in 2019, the Department of Energy convened the Finance and Resilience Initiative, bringing together experts from commercial real estate, insurance, and finance industries to kind of demystify some of these concepts and produce a series of resources to help building owners get a handle on resilience planning. Uh, and the whole effort was structured around this resilience roadmap, which we came up with uh, with the roundtable participants, which is a set of six, six steps that any building owner can follow in order to develop a resilience management plan. Um, and then we worked with the roundtable to create a series of fact sheets and resources about each of those steps. So the reason I mention this is that, you know, all the financing options we're going to talk about today are actively being used by commercial building owners to address these resilience risks. That's really at step four, as you can see there, financing and implementing improvements. And we're gonna hear a lot more from our speakers about that, but we're not just talking about energy, energy savings potential here. We're also talking about the ability of these financial products to unlock resilience in uh, commercial properties as well and other properties. To go to the next slide, uh, I'm excited to say that the uh, Resilience Roadmap is now live and on the Solutions Center. So you can get to it through that link at the bottom of the screen there, or just go on the Solutions Center and search for Resilience Roadmap. And again, it's a series of resources organized around these steps. And if you go to the next slide, um, since we have a lot of building owners on the line, I know many of whom are, are concerned about resilience, uh, I wanted to share one, one interesting takeaway from our work with the Roundtable that I thought you, you all might find fascinating. And that is that, as I think a lot of you know, one challenge that a lot of organizations face is communicating the financial benefits of resilience to CFOs and other financial decision makers who are used to thinking in terms of steady cash flows rather than sort of episodic risks like climate change or earthquakes, right? Um, and so in response to that, and I think for the first time ever, we worked with the roundtable to sort of map potential climate, weather, and resilience risks to the typical financial statements of a commercial building. And I won't go through this in detail. We, we go into much more detail in the resilience roadmap. But I think the first takeaway here is that most of these line items are being or will be impacted um, in terms of, for example, under balance sheet, property, plant, and equipment, building owners are likely to see a decrease in valuation for vulnerable or inefficient properties, possibly limitations to liquidity as they can't buy and sell properties that are in areas prone to climate or other weather related risks. Going down to the income statement, um, we could, we're in fact already seeing a decrease in asset marketability to tenants for properties that are considered not resilient, an increase in property downtime potentially, and kind of the mother of all risks, abandonment risk in which it's impossible to fill a property with, with paying tenants. Um, all things that could happen in an in a intensified climate and weather disaster scenario. And then there's also a kind of another category of risks often called transition risks that aren't so much about the direct impacts of climate change or resilience on a building, but instead, uh, 
other costs that are incurred by that building as part of a broader transition to resilience. So things like tax increases to pay for seawalls or, um, or disaster recovery bills, even increases in codes, which uh, building codes, which it could increase the compliance costs just to build new buildings in markets that are likely to be most impacted. So I think the takeaway here is that even if your building never experiences a direct impact from climate change or a seismic event or other resilience risks, your preparedness for those risks can still very much impact the, uh, the financial performance of the building. And that was one of the key takeaways uh, that our, and one of the conclusions that our roundtable came to. Um, I mentioned that again because the three folks on the line here and, and a lot of the financial products we're going to be talking about today are actively being used by these building owners to kind of get out ahead of this risk as a resilience planning and, and risk mitigation tool. Um, to go to the next slide, I do want to mention if you've been in better build, if you've been in better buildings for a while or come to other events in the past, you'll have heard about this a bunch of times, but I want to keep reminding you that we have this great tool called the Better Buildings Financing Navigator, which includes all of the financing options we're talking about today, plus a bunch of other ones. It's a free and publicly available online tool that we developed to help building owners uh, find financing solutions for, for energy projects, basically. You can explore the different financing solutions. You can answer a few questions about your project and about your preferences and get matched to a financing solution that might be a good fit. And then of course you can connect directly with the Better Buildings financial allies who can actually finance your project in the event that you want to. So highly recommend you check that out at the link. If you actually just go back real quick, Kyle, at the, at the link below. You can also just Google Better Buildings Financing Navigator and that'll get you there as well. And finally, I'm going to the final slide here. Um, before I hand it over to Rachel, I just want to mention that our network of financial allies are the ones who made all of this work possible. So if you're not familiar, the allies are a group of 50 financing companies ranging from the big guys like Bank of America and Citi to medium-sized specialty financiers all the way down to startups with hyper-specialized products, all of whom are committed to deploying capital into clean energy projects and commercial buildings. And they're really on board to help all of you, all the other partners in Better Buildings and other folks get more projects done. So if you ever have a question about clean energy finance or you have a project that needs financing, you can always feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to introduce you to any of these folks. Uh, my contact information is gonna be at the end. Um, and you can also find these, these, all of these uh, providers directly through the Financing Navigator as well if you just go to the Connect with Providers section. And I'm happy to say that all three of our speakers today are members of, of three of these financial allies. So welcome to everybody. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, who's going to do a deep dive into some of the recent trends in commercial pace financing and how it's being used for things that you might not expect. Things like new construction, seismic projects, and resilience projects as well. So Rachel, please take it away. All right. Thanks, Joe. I'm happy to be here today and glad we have a, a really great diverse group of folks. Um, that are interested in learning more about different types of financing that's available. So uh, ready to, to dive in and give you guys an overview of what's going on in commercial pace. So um, if you want to go to the next slide here. So as Joe mentioned, um, I work with Petros Pace Finance. We are a national commercial pace lender, a pretty much 99% focused on uh, commercial pace alone. So we transact all across the country uh, where pace is available. Uh, project sizes from half a million to 200 million plus, if you can believe that there uh, is demand out there for uh, commercial pace for projects of that size. Um, and we have committed capital uh, with our investor partners in order to deploy into these projects. So there is no shortage of demand uh, for folks that uh, want to uh, invest in these great uh, renewable and efficient projects. And so one of the things that we've also done too is really taking a leadership role in building out uh, the CPACE network and making sure that we can broaden uh, as much as we can uh, the availability of the programs. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the, uh, in the presentation here. Next slide, please. So I, I won't go into this in too much depth. I think most of the people on the call have probably heard the basics of PACE, but I didn't want to be remiss uh, for those where this may be a new concept, but um, commercial PACE um, stands for Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. It is a relatively new, uh, but an extremely quickly growing um, alternative financing mechanism that is meant to carve out the energy efficiency, water efficiency, renewable energy, and, and resiliency aspects um, of projects that folks may be doing, whether it is 
um, a retrofit, new construction, as Joe mentioned, um, or if you're doing a gut rehab uh, project, all of those would likely have measures that would qualify for PACE. Um, and really what makes it different is that it's designed to be 100% financing and it's low cost, long term meant to line up with the, uh, the financing or the amortization period will line up with uh, the life of the equipment that it's financing. And then it's also repaid as a tax assessment, which is another uh, part that makes it different from those traditional forms of financing is a, a voluntary special uh, assessment on property tax bills. Next slide, please. And just, uh, we'll go into this a little bit more in detail when we start talking about some of the case studies, but really wanted to highlight some of the benefits. Again, it's, it's low cost, it's long term with terms up to, you know, between 20 and 30 years, uh, depending on where the market and what the measures are that are being financed. And it is also fixed rate financing. So um, ideally what we're going to do is give you all of the cash up front so that you don't have to come out of pocket for anything. So all of the closing costs, capitalized interest, um, if there's going to be a construction period, all of that is designed to be financed um, into it so that there's nothing required out of pocket. Um, ultimately, it can decrease your utility bills and lower your overall maintenance costs. It allows you to put in those efficiency and renewable met, uh, measures that your building tenants may uh, desire, even as an owner-occupied facility, right? If you just have uh, deferred maintenance maybe that needs to be done, this is a great alternative uh, to consider when you're looking at your financing options. Go ahead and push the next slide. Thank you. And so here I just really wanted to show you for commercial pace financing, it can go across all asset types. We've worked with industrial office, retail, uh, multifamily, I would say right now, just in terms of trends that we're seeing in the market and where a lot of commercial PACE funds are being deployed, it is into the hospitality sector, it is in multifamily, mixed use, retail, um, and we're starting to see quite a bit too in your senior living and student housing sectors as well. But really, any type of facility um, that is not residential or that is not uh, government owned would qualify, uh, would potentially be a good candidate for commercial case financing. And then here's, here's another aspect I wanted to, we won't go into this in detail, but I wanted to give, give everyone an idea of what types of measures can be funded. Um, so when you're looking at a, a building retrofit, anything that is energy efficient or water efficient in most states where PACE is available would qualify. There's typically not a hard and fast uh, list of measures that actually qualify. What they're going to say is, does putting in this new HVAC system, does it reduce your energy consumption? And if so, then it's likely going to qualify. Same thing on the water side. And then certain states like California and Florida and Oregon, um, and a couple of others as well have carved out and made special allowances for resiliency measures like seismic, wind hardening, and microgrids to be funded uh, via commercial PACE, which is, which is great because as you guys um, I'm sure are fully aware, seismic measures can be you know, extremely expensive and don't have very much of any payback, right? It's there to, to give you the resiliency measures that you need. So it's great that folks now have the option uh, to finance it with PACE. And we're seeing um, a lot of folks uh, take, that, take that opportunity. And then same with renewable energy. I think most people probably when they think about commercial PACE for the first time, that's maybe more of what they associate the financing with, um, is that it's a way to finance solar projects. And that's true and we can do that, uh, but it's certainly more broad than that. And so Keep in mind that all of these measures can be done uh, for the most part in a retroactive basis, as well as certain states where they do allow it to be done. You know, if you're taking a building back down to the studs and building back up, uh, those efficiency measures that are being put in, whether it's over code um, or it's again just uh, more efficient than what was there previously, could qualify. And then same thing for new construction. So when you're looking at the building envelope or uh, mechanical electrical plumbing systems that are going to go into the design of new buildings. Those, uh, the measures that we're looking at here could be carved out um, and funded via PACE as opposed to, you know, 
more expensive um, mezzanine financing or prep equity or something of that sort. So it's a really great way uh, to help facilitate additional uh, implementation of these measures in the built environment. And here I just wanted to give you guys an idea of where PACE is available. And um, this map has probably even changed since we put it together and sent it to you guys because I think Washington uh, State should now be, be lit up. They have a PACE statute. So we're now at 37 states plus DC that have an active PACE statute authorizing um, the use of commercial PACE. Typically from there, that has to be opted in at the local level. Um, but these states that are all blue um, or some shade of blue have the ability to utilize PACE. So it's, it's pretty well available uh, in your major metropolitan areas. All right, so here's, here's the meat of, of what we really wanted to get into to show you guys. When we look at this project, this was an office uh, building that was funded here in Houston. Um, this is what most people think about when they think of CPACE. It's, you know, the building had aging mechanical equipment that they needed to replace. And so they used commercial PACE so that they didn't have to come out of pocket to finance that. So they used a little over a million dollars to replace their chiller and some efficient lighting uh, and the associated, you know, BFDs and air handling units and <clears throat> building controls and monitoring systems. So that is your kind of textbook I think PACE project when folks think about that. And so uh, this is a really great example of, of how they were able to improve their building uh, for their uh, tenants. Next slide, thank you. And so when we talk about what is emerging in PACE, Joe, I think you hit the nail right on the head, right? New construction is where we're starting to see quite a bit of activity and we expect to see it continue that way. Um, this, this client was out of Ohio and they were building a senior living facility. So they decided to use about $8 million worth of commercial PACE to fund their more efficient building envelope HVAC system and lighting that they were going to include in the construction. And so really what they were able to do here is one, get the financing that they needed, right? And make sure that they were putting together the most efficient capital stack as they could. So by pulling in pace, um, they were able to displace, you know, whether it was higher cost equity or MES financing, and that significantly uh, improved their weighted average cost of capital on the project. Um, and so keep in mind too, with pace, because it is tied to the property, generally after construction, it's non-recourse financing, which for um, developers and building owners, that's, that's obviously something that they're very interested um, in hearing about as well. So, and then for this instance too, it's also a great way uh, for the local governments um, and municipalities to allow development um, to continue without any pocket, it's, it's no money out of pocket for these local governments. So they're not having to do an abatement or anything of that sort. Um, to help the developers move these projects forward. This is all private capital that's being invested into these projects. Next slide, please. And here's another one that's also um, a growing trend and I suspect we're gonna see quite a bit more of this, but um, earlier or late last year, uh, we worked with a client out of California to secure about $11 million worth of PACE financing. They were doing a uh, gut rehab uh, of a property into a, a boutique hotel. And so a good portion of what they were doing uh, was a seismic retrofit. And so it just worked really nicely uh, that they could use PACE uh, to come in and fund that. And, you know, obviously it's, it's cheaper than others uh, sources of capital. So it, it really improves their ability to service debt and generate free cash flow on the asset. And then here's another one that is, I think, especially relevant today. Um, we're starting to see quite a few of these. Refinancing has always uh, been an option for PACE, just uh, wasn't uh, utilized very frequently. But here's a, a good example of a client of ours in uh, New York that had a hotel that they um, had renovated recently and decided that they wanted to utilize uh, PACE retroactively to refinance those measures that they had taken out debt uh, to originally fund. And so they were able to use almost $10 million worth of PACE 
uh, to pay for those envelope plumbing, uh, lighting. You'll, you'll start to see a theme in the types of measures um, that are funded here, uh, but they were able to pull this in um, and then use that to put into uh, the cash that they were able to get back from PACE uh, to put into some additional uh, improvements that they were doing on the property. So it worked out really well for all parties. Um, we worked really closely with the folks within New York State um, and the other parties. And um, this, I think, was the largest PACE funding to date in New York. And I think you're going to start to see a lot more um, out of that market. But what's really important here is just in today's environment, um, where um, there's a pullback um, in terms of, of funding that's available and everyone's trying to uh, be as cogniz cognizant as they can uh, when they're putting together their capital stacks. Um, if you can go back and refinance something uh, with PACE that was done efficient uh, construction, this could be a really great alternative for you. And we're starting to see quite a few projects pop up uh, here recently. And just uh, before we go, I wanted to kind of give some, some closing thoughts on what we're seeing in the PACE market. Uh, Joe, you, you alluded to this earlier too, right? According to the numbers that PACE Nation has put out, uh, we're seeing substantial growth in commercial PACE activity. And as you can tell, I, the numbers are really small here, but I think that's through 2025. Uh, the numbers just continue to, to shoot up and we, we continue to see that exponential growth. I mean, our firm alone, right? The pipeline uh, that we're looking at um, has grown significantly. And so over a billion and a half uh, dollars of cumulative CPACE investment. So while a lot of people will say, you know, it's, it's still new, it is new, um, but I think it's a great milestone that we're over a billion dollars of projects that have been funded to really prove out the concept really across the board in terms of asset classes. Um, and whether it's retrofit or new construction. So um, we're really pleased to see that that's continuing to grow. Um, a couple of the market trends that we are seeing, again, new construction and renovation projects, uh, as well as retroactive financing, that is, uh, that's growing every day. And then the average financing dollar is really increasing per transaction. So I would say, you know, four or five years ago, your average PACE, um, commercial PACE project was probably in the two to $400,000 range. And what we're seeing today is, you know, it's easily over 5 million um, as the average project size. And then again, you know, it is not uncommon for us, and I'm sure it's across the entire industry, right, to see projects that are 20, 40, 50 million dollars of just commercial PACE that they're carving out for large mixed use projects or uh, new development projects in some of the uh, more expensive markets uh, for development. And then let's see, some of the, oh, if you go back one more, there we go, just a couple of other things. So a couple of the things that we're still trying to work through uh, to, to make sure that the market continues to grow for CPACE is really just market awareness. And events like this are, are fantastic and uh, the Better Buildings Group has been a great um, advocate and understanding and communicating the benefits of uh, CPACE to the entire market and how it can apply. And so we're really trying to do as much as we can there. And then as much, you know, the more folks that we get that utilize it and have case studies and that can uh, make referrals and recommendations to say that they've, they've used it, it's, it's not too good to be true. Um, that, that'll continue to help the market grow. And then just broader lender acceptance. Um, but, any of the mortgage lenders on the property have to consent to PACE. And so for a while, that was a pretty big barrier. Um, it, it is still there to some extent, but it has changed quite drastically, um, even to the extent where sometimes we have leads come to us um, from mortgage lenders, right, that have borrowers that have gaps that need to be filled. And so they're trying to find a way to help them do that. So um, that has, has pleasantly, uh, changed course a little bit. And then geographic availability. It's not available everywhere. Um, but again, we continue to do what we can to grow that, work with our borrowers that may have uh, portfolios across the country. And so as they're moving into new markets to develop or have properties, uh, we can work with local governments. And um, I expect that that's going to continue growing as well, just as folks are looking for recovery financing tools uh, based on kind of the, what we've seen in the market today. So I think that's going to pick up substantially. Um, and then just, you know, I think it goes without saying, 
uh, COVID-19 has certainly been uh, a disruption to the business. Um, but, you know, a lot of new construction projects are on hold as uh, mortgage lenders are kind of pulling back a little bit. Um, so we have seen more of a shift to retrofit and retroactive financings, but um, we've, it's, it's still been extremely busy, um, I think, across the sector um, for this type of financing. So it shows that it kind of has some resiliency um, as well across all economic cycles. So with that, I think I will, that concludes my thoughts. I'll turn it over to you, I think, Edwin, uh, and then we'll answer questions toward the end. Great. Yep. Uh, let me just interject real quick, Edwin, before you get started. I'm seeing a lot of good questions coming in. Um, keep them coming. I saw a couple of questions come in through Zoom. Just a reminder, please ask them through Slido rather than through Zoom so that everybody can see them and have a chance to, to upvote them. Um, and yeah, so next up is Edwin from Citizen Energy. So he's going to talk through how efficiency as a service is sort of changing the conversation around uh, energy retrofits. So Edwin, please take it away. Thanks, Joe. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for attending and for having me. Um, as Joe mentioned, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, efficiency as a service and sharing some of uh, my experiences or my, my company's experience uh, with efficiency as a service. We've been around since uh, 2012. Um, as you probably heard by now, uh, efficiency as a service is has become really a popular method to finance energy efficiency, energy generation, or just simply other performance improvement projects uh, for, for buildings you have. Um, next slide, please. Uh, you have uh, different flavors of as a service. Again, as you probably heard it uh, referred to as uh, energy as a service or energy savings as a service. Um, there's also uh, lumens as a service if it's a lighting project. All these uh, models have very similar characteristics and actually they, they share, uh, they're similar to offerings in the greater as a service industry. Um, things that have been around for a while now like software as a service. Uh, I'm thinking Salesforce is an example of that or data hosting as a service uh, like through Amazon Web Services who you pay to host your data. Um, a little bit more specifically, um, real quick, uh, efficiency as a service is known for, a, for being, again, a pay for performance solution. So the customer uh, doesn't necessarily purchase the equipment. They're purchasing performance elements or results as part of their contract. So that could uh, be in the form of cooling performance, uh, lighting levels performance, right? More, uh, more lumens, um, resiliency, as was mentioned earlier. And the, you know, what's very common is savings performance, right? It's been around for a while, that model, uh, where uh, customers pay a share of the measured savings every month through the savings that are being created by the service provider or the equipment they're installing. Typically, uh, you don't have uh, any uh, upfront capital from the customer. Um, and even though the uh, service provider obtains financing um, to the customer, it is structured for off balance sheet uh, treatment. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's known as an off balance sheet uh, solution. Um, again, because the customer, uh, or sorry, the, the, the um, provider, typically owns the equipment or, or owns it in partnership with the finance uh, partner. And uh, because of that, because they own the equipment, the third party is also responsible for installation, obviously again, performance and ongoing maintenance. One quick thing I will also know is that under uh, efficiency as a service, um, the customer has the flexibility to request an increase in performance if they don't like the performance um, that they've contracted for. And that usually takes uh, into account some refresh options for the equipment. Uh, and again, that's in an effort to provide the customer with more value, more savings, or just higher output on any of the contracted performance elements. Next slide, please. All right, next year, um, we're gonna get you all involved a bit and uh, we're gonna launch a poll uh, to request some feedback. Um, 
Attendees, if you haven't already, uh, please go to slido.com, enter the event code uh, BB Summit, and select uh, what's new in energy efficiency. Kyle, could you uh, put the poll up there? So he, here's the poll. The question is, have you been involved in a project that utilized efficiency as a service or uh, similar financing? Uh, we have the answers coming in. The answers are, or the options are no. This is the first time you've heard about efficiency as a service. Yes, several projects. Yes, only one project. Let's give it a couple more seconds. Hey, Edwin, I'd say we're doing pretty good if only 20% are saying they haven't heard of it. That's probably, that's probably a little below average there, eh? Yeah, I was actually expecting uh, more yeses, but this this will help me as I go through my presentation. Let's give it just a couple more seconds. 179, 182, great, great. Uh, Kyle, if you could go back to the slides, please. Uh, this next slide is, is just a very uh, basic overview of how the efficiency services agreement works um, or energy services agreement. It's very similar. Um, Joe already went over it a bit, but it, it really follows the principles of, of project financing. Um, this is actually available in the, on the Better Buildings uh, Solution Center website. I recommend, again, you go there uh, for more great resources. But if you look at the... Um, uh, bottom left hand side, you have the uh, ESA provider that will enter into a, a services agreement with the customer. The customer is then obligated to pay for, usually on a monthly basis, sometimes quarterly, for uh, those performance outputs. But at the same time, uh, that ESA provider will um, enter into contract with a, a contractor. In many cases, it could be an ESCO, energy services company. Uh, to install the equipment and uh, to also uh, the ESCO provides ongoing maintenance for the actual uh, equipment upgrades. Next slide, please. All right, just very briefly, Joe, Joe already uh, highlighted the uh, state of the market growth for efficiency as a service. I'll just add a little value here. Um, this is a, just a quick glimpse. Uh, this report is from uh, Business Wire, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, um, and it's for uh, growth forecasts around the world for energy as a service, looking at the overall industry again. And we're showing about a compounded annual growth rate of 37% as a forecast. Next slide, please. All right, this is where I'm probably gonna spend most of my time. Um, these next couple of slides, um, are, I'm gonna highlight some challenges that I've come across from my experience with efficiency as a service, uh, which as many of you know, those challenges can conventionally, right, can provide opportunities in the market. Um, some of these are also uh, speculative, I would say. Again, uh, it's things that my company's gone through, but maybe others haven't. Uh, so just wanted to throw out that disclaimer. Um, uh, COVID-19 was mentioned earlier. Uh, obviously, it's the hot topic of the season, and everybody has imp been impacted by that. Uh, Price Waterhouse Cooper conducted a recent survey of uh, U.S.-based uh, chief financial officers, and 67% of those surveyed are deferring or canceling plan investments they then took it a step further in that same survey uh, to essentially break down priority areas that they will cut. Uh, and as you can see from the graph to the right, uh, the area of uh, facilities and capital expenditures tops that list, right, to no surprise. Um, so that was, very, that was very interesting. I think it was about 300 uh, folks surveyed and they've been running this survey uh, on an almost weekly basis now. So I recommend you guys check that out. Uh, but the, the point here is that efficiency as a service directly addresses that main issue uh, because it, again, it's structured not as a capital expenditure on the balance sheet, it's structured as an operating expense, OPEX. Uh, so these um, building owners uh, can make these facility upgrades now and create 
much needed value uh, to combat the COVID impact. Uh, another challenge uh, uh, slash opportunity is uh, vacant buildings, right? Um, uh, from the opportunity side, uh, some of these uh, vacant buildings provide great opportunities to streamline installations because install is easiest, right? When no one is in the building, we've actually seen an uptick in installations and contracts. Um, and, but but it also you know ri uh, gives rise to other questions that that are a bit speculative in nature. Um, we're all here today on Zoom, right? We're not. Uh, I think it's the first time ever, right, uh, that this conference has been held through uh, web conferencing. And I think uh, what I've seen is some building owners are starting to realize, or at least they're evaluating whether or not they need this office space or, or the built environment, physical buildings. Uh, for their employees to be productive. We actually just had a recent customer uh, who we did a complete uh, lighting and controls uh, efficiency as a service retrofit uh, that is now considering consolidating employees into another building. And the question arose literally just yesterday. It's like, what are they going to do with this building we just retrofitted? And, and those questions come up uh, uh, in terms of whether they're going to repurpose it, if it's repurposed, uh, are they going to sublease it or are they going to sell it? Who's it going to be sold to? If more people are working from home, do we have uh, a growth in residential efficiency as a service? So again, some questions, challenges and opportunities that are popping up in this space. Uh, credit risk uh, is also a big factor. I've, you know, equity investors, or on the sidelines, uh, debt providers are still lending, uh, but requirements and criteria is changing because of this. So again, some other challenges that uh, we've come across. Um, this last one is um, just more broader in nature. Uh, I think there's an opportunity uh, to include efficiency as a service or just clean energy and energy efficiency financing into these economic stimulus policies to combat COVID-19. Um, it's been done before, it can be done again, and it really creates uh, jobs and, and can drive economic growth. Next slide, please. Couple more challenges and opportunities. Uh, smaller size projects, I think uh, for those of you on the web conference uh, that have been around for a while have uh, probably know by now that financing smaller size projects is a big challenge because uh, financing typically, right? Uh, typically financing a $100,000 project carries the same or the similar transaction cost as a $1 million project. So it's logical and more lucrative to finance larger projects. And, 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 and a lot of us are doing uh, what we can to combat that. Uh, my company particularly has worked on addressing this issue by uh, doing three things, aggregating, standardizing process, and streamlining to make these smaller projects worthwhile. To the right, you can see a very basic diagram of how one way that these projects can be bundled under a hold co or a, or a special purpose entity. And you can reduce costs significantly by using shared services or just shared processes uh, to make them again much more, uh, make those projects or that hold co uh, generate better returns for investors and everyone involved. Um, next, next challenge is, is contractual. Contractual challenges, um, I'll go over a couple of them here or a few here. Um, we've seen in states uh, with higher subsidies, customer, customers are more willing to take the risk and purchase the equipment or, or take out a loan. And the question is, what, what can we do in order to incorporate those subsidies into contracts so customers see more value and efficiency as a service and not purchasing? Um, you also have challenges in terms. I think the, the days of the 25 year performance contract are, 
are probably over. I'm not sure if I'm overstepping here, but we see our customers and folks we work with, they want more flexibility, right? They want the ability uh, to uh, adjust their subscriptions or, or their contracts, uh, kind of like they do with their Amazon hosting, right? Uh, that it's, could be done real time or even sometimes cancel uh, at any point. Um, end of term options uh, are also uh, a big deal. Um, they want, again, the flexibility to continue upgrade, request uh, more performance, or just simply uh, go back to the way they were before. Though, though we're seeing less of that. Most folks are more uh, willing to increase performance and really like the idea of having someone else manage those assets for them. And, and particularly for CFOs, making that a fixed cost on the income statement as an expense. Got about one minute left, Edwin. Good, good, thanks for the heads up. Um, real sure. quickly, uh, one other challenge you should look, look out for is the new FASB rules, if you're not familiar with them. These are accounting standards that govern leases and these types of agreements in the past uh, operating leases were very similar to service agreements. Uh, they really didn't make a distinction between equipment versus performance elements. And now with operating leases having to be capitalized on the balance sheet, if over 12 months, uh, you can uh, have a service agreement that reads like an operating lease and you could get into some trouble. Um, things to look out for and research further. Last slide, please. Um, this is, uh, this last slide just provides a um, case study that you can find on the Better Building Solutions Center. The, I'll let you uh, look at that on your own time. Uh, I think the, the biggest takeaway here as it relates to my presentation is this is an example of two small projects, a total investment of 300,000 that were uh, bundled uh, for a total of about 1.5 million. Uh, that were all very similar characteristics, underwriting criteria, location, um, and those are some of those results. So again, an example of how to bundle smaller projects into efficiency as a service. Those are, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, please reach out or I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Edwin. We got a ton of good questions rolling in. Um, please keep them coming. We're gonna have our, uh, have our hands full with the Q&A. So Greg, uh, over to you finally. So Greg's gonna talk a little bit more about how green bonds have gone from a relatively new concept in 2014 to deploying hundreds of billions of dollars as of 2019. So Greg, please go ahead. Looks like you're still on mute, Greg. There, there you go. go. Thanks, Joe. Uh, this is Greg Montgomery with uh, Clean Source Capital based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And glad to be talking with you about green bonds. It's a marketplace we've been involved in uh, for over the last 10 years um, and, and have watched it evolve, uh, mature with time. So I'm gonna uh, run through in the 15 minutes we have together, just you know, why green bonds, what they are, who's issuing them and what, um, uh, uh, you know, what, what are the principles on which a green bond gets issued? So if we go to the first slide, Joe, you know, why green bonds? Uh, this, is a, this is a response from the capital marketplace to the fact that there's uh, positive proof of the acceleration of climate change. Incredible leaders and serious people want to do something about that and address, address the, the, the risks that are presented by climate and finance is a great way to do that, particularly when you start looking at uh, the building sector, which accounts for 40% um, you know, of the greenhouse gas emissions worldwide, 70% of the energy spent. So it's a good way to, good place to start doing work and make a difference. And the green bonds came about to address the need for financing for projects. If you have projects, you have finance. And if you're going to have green projects, you need to have green finance. And so the green bonds specifically address the Paris Climate Accord um, to combat climate change and, and uh, bring global temperature rise down to two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. And what we've seen here in the United States is uh, that the, the leadership on this issue is coming, it's a grassroots movement. It's coming from the state and local government and private sector. Um, you know, we're towns, cities, counties who, the, the, the constituents that are really experiencing the effect of climate change, they're the ones responding and wanting to use creative financing vehicles for, um, 
for addressing climate change. Um, so in the capital markets are responding to that. You know, like-minded investors uh, take weather and environmental cha challenges seriously. They're seeking investment op opportunities to provide sound returns while planning and protecting against property and casualty risk and hedging against environmental regulatory risks. There's 1,700 investors who have signed on to the UN principles responsible investing, representing over 90 trillion of capital. And they view environmental and climate rise as credit and financial risk. So if we go to the next slide, so the, the market is evolving to create a structure to provide confidence uh, to this investment community investing in environmental projects. And in order to bring this, uh, this, this confidence into level of playing field between what you, know, you would call a traditional or plain vanilla bond and a green bond, there's really six concerns uh, that the marketplace is looking for. They want to see credible fixed income solutions for investing in environment projects that have an environmental impact. They want a clear cut definition of what constitutes a green investment. Uh, they want to be able to measure and verify the evidence of the environmental benefits uh, as a result of their investment. Um, they're looking for parties who have the requisite environmental expertise, um, accountability, uh, accountability and due diligence for structuring uh, a green investment. And they're looking for standardized and comparable reporting across their portfolios so that they can track all investments equally. The overarching concern is that investors want a bond that is simple and scalable. It has the same risk profile and same basic structure. So they're not looking, don't think of green bonds as a new financial instrument. It's basically uh, uh, using the, the, the infrastructure that, um, that has already been put in place for uh, bonds in the capital markets, but targeting specifically environmental oriented projects. So that's why green bonds have evolved as a specific class to address these concerns and provide a vehicle. Um, hey, Greg, we got a comment saying you're just a little bit hard to hear for some folks. If you want to just okay. uh, be a little right, bit louder, me, that would be me, awesome. Yeah, let me move my microphone off. Maybe that Thank you. Okay, great. So um, the, the green bonds, really the difference is that they're primarily centered around the green use of bond proceeds for, versus general corporate purposes. So uh, this, this allows for a new dialogue between the issuers and the investors relating to how the proceeds are gonna be used. Um, so it's almost a story, if you will, about the bonds. It's, it's um, and, and, and addressing specifically the, the environmental and climate benefits that the, uh, that the investors wanna see. So to, to, to give a framework for the addressing these, these factors that the market was looking for, the, the International Capital Markets Association in 2014 first published the Voluntary Green Bond Principles, which became the framework for green bonds going forward. And as a result of this, uh, you've seen the market explode. So if we go to the next, next slide, you know, the green bond principles, um, there's basically four of them. They want to see that the proceeds are used for environmentally sustainable eligible projects. They want to see how that project is selected against a framework that the issuer has for supporting environmental sustainability. They want to see that the proceeds are being managed in a way that they can be traced to the use for the very specific project approved. And they want to have reporting um, on the proceeds and the project's impact, both from the issuer's perspective as well as the investor's perspective. So it's really just a simple set of questions that any issuer should be able to answer. You know, what is the project funds being used for? How is the project selected? How are you managing tracking? How will the investors know the money is going to the projects you said it was going to? And how are you going to evaluate the project? So external review um, of, of these principles in and, and determining that a bond is a green bond has become important um, so that their objectivity is brought into the process. You can think of this as almost like third party credit rating agency reports, uh, the role that they play in the bond market today. And the benefits um, are, you know, are pretty significant. Uh, you know, the, 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 uh, since 2014, the green market has grown and you've got a broad buy side, buy side and sell side acceptance of these and governance using these principles. Um, you know, investors are able to have certainty that they, the money's being used for the assets that they uh, issue so they're going to be used for transparency and reporting. 
objectivity, the standardized templates, all of this is increasing awareness in the issuer community of the importance of the framework. So if we go to the next slide, and we saw this uh, in one of Joe's earlier slides, you know, the, the market is growing rapidly. Um, you know, the first green bond was, was, was issued back in 2012. And then with the bond principles in 2014, the market accelerated to where it was you know, this past year, 257 billion in bonds, 51% growth over 2018. Uh, approximately 1,800 green bonds from approximately 500 issuers. The U.S. was the top issuer of green bonds, 51 billion, with Fannie Mae being the top issuer in the United States, 23 billion of green mortgage-backed securities. Um, so approximately 800 billion in bonds have been issued uh, to date since the first bond back in 2012. So if we go to the next slide, the types of green bonds are what you would see in, in the bond market in general. You've got you know, a use of proceeds bond, a sort of standard recourse general purpose bond, except it's being used principal borrowings are being earmarked and allocated to eligible green projects under the issuer's framework. Then you've got uh, revenue bonds and project bonds, which are tied specifically to a source of revenue. And so they're, they're typically non-recourse bonds, um, either, either to a, a basket of projects or maybe you know, a, a bucket of PACE loans or ESCO contracts, or you can you know, have specific projects like solar projects, wind projects, or a building. Um, that would, that would uh, be tied in the revenues so that that project would support the repayment of the bond. And then you're starting to see green securitized bonds, particularly the recent CPEX securitizations have been taken out through, through a green bond vehicle. So if we go to the next slide, the types of issuers, um, or, why, or really why would you issue a bond? It's you know, strategic and managerial to, to align your financing with your sustainability and environmental policies. It's reputational. If you wanna make a statement about your commitment to climate change. Uh, financing, you've got a growing demand, investor diversification, improving liquidity and pricing, market access, and then regulatory. The benefits um, to the issuer, there's evidence that a green bond does outperform conventional bond in both pricing and execution. Uh, recent research has confirmed that um, with the growing demand for the bonds in the environmental investment community versus the lack of certified supply has created a little bit of an imbalance uh, that's, that's resulted in larger book covers during pricing, uh, larger spread tightening during the book building, and, uh, and then even uh, uh, you know, pricing outside of the yield curves I mean, in the secondary market. You know, the, the offset there is the increased costs. You've got third party review and ongoing measurement reporting, but um, that, uh, that doesn't, you know, those are smaller costs compared to the benefits. So if we go to the next slide, you know, the first principle of the bond, of the voluntary green bond principles is use proceeds. And you can see that in 2019, 30% of uh, green bonds were, went to buildings. And if we go to the next slide, you can see the type of, of, of projects that are supported by the use of proceeds. It's what you would expect. And what uh, are the, the other panels have talked about, renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, you know, clean transportation, climate change, green buildings. Um, you, can, you, know, you can uh um, bring in additional project types, like if uh, if you have uh, net zero buildings or lead buildings, those those could those could very well under the right framework. Um, and, uh, you know, it can cover both construction and, uh, as well as investment, as well as land conservation and green building rating systems can help um, in, in supporting the use of proceeds for the project. So if you go to the next slide, uh, and I'll just point out, I mean, again, these are some of the categories we just talked about and the type of, type of, of, uh, of, of measures that would fall within those categories that could be used within the proceeds, you know, within the proceeds for renewable energy. I mean, that's obvious. It's you know, beyond site renewable energy generation, solar, battery storage, or CHP, energy efficiency measures, uh, you know, sustainable land use is another example of green bonds in the development community. And then down at the bottom, the climate change uh, and, and resiliency that we heard about earlier. So you go to the next slide, um, the evaluation selection, so the issuer needs to have an environmental sustainability framework, a program with goals that they're seeking to achieve, and then they select the project within that framework. 
the best practices is have a committee of stakeholders from within the organization that, that evaluate the projects presented and select the projects to be funded. And so, you know, the type of considerations in a real estate framework would be the energy efficiency goals, renewable energy goals, greenhouse gas reduction goals, you know, whether you're building uh, certified uh, buildings or net zero buildings, energy programs, et cetera. If we go to the next slide, um, you know, once, so you've got use proceeds, you've got a framework for selecting the project where you're going to use proceeds. Now you have to manage the proceeds. That's the third principle. And that's just tracking the proceeds and tracing the approval to the green project. So if it's a general revenue bond, you want to segregate the funds inside of your sub account, be able to trace the use of those funds out of that. If you're doing a project finance, it's very easy. You can have a project escrow account, you can ring fence it. You want to make certain that your interim, interim investments of cash on hand in the project escrow are being invested appropriately. And you just report the use of these proceeds to, 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 to your investors so that they're aware that, that it meets this third principle. We go to the fourth principle. Uh, then we, um, we go to the, to the next slide. Then uh, we, we, I'm sorry, this, we continue reporting. So there's pre-issuance information that you would put in your in your, your offering memorandum that would talk about the metrics that you're going to track. Then you have the post-issuance use of proceeds, construction of the project, and then it's voluntary, but you're seeing more and more of this, and that's the impact reporting. You want both the qualitative discussion, a narrative of the impact the project's having on the environment, and actually if you can quantitate that through specific metrics, particularly the metrics that you told the investors you want to track. Track um, that's very uh, very powerful reporting on the on, on how this bond is making a difference in the, in the effort to get to those climate change goals. Um, your primary indicators in this type of reporting would be green building certifications and energy ratings. So if we go to the next slide, uh, these are just some examples of type of reporting and the measurements that you would be reporting against in the metrics. So you know, obviously the absolute kilowatt hours generated for renewable energy or kilowatt hours avoided for your energy efficiency and greenhouse gas reductions based on the, measure, on the particular gases that you're measuring. And then we get to the next slide. Um, uh, so those are the four principles. And then external review, as we talked about, is a, is a best practice where you have a third party that assures the investors that, the, that the, these principles are being met there's various levels of external review, everything from just a second party who opines on it after reviewing the literature and the process and, and gives an opinion that uh, investors can rely on. Uh, Moody's has, and other agencies have come up with a scoring rating, just like the credit agencies. Um, you can have a, a, a third party audit or you can have post issuance verification assurance. The, it's important that the external review be an from an independent source, so there's objectivity. There's a growing universe. I just my uh, 15 minutes, Jeff. Um, so there's a growing universe of service providers, and uh, the International Capital Markets Association uh, publishes who these reviewers are for reference and, 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 and uh, uh, use. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is a case study of actually the first corporate green bond that was issued for a real estate development company in Sweden, Vasa Kronen, uh, at, who at that time was the largest um, real estate developer in Sweden and one of the largest ones in Europe um, and, uh, with, a, with a, you know, 180 buildings, $15 billion development portfolio, a sustainable mission. Um, to, to really emphasize renewable energy generation, reduce energy consumption in their buildings. Uh, they, had, they had reduced their portfolio 50% by 2009 and have a, a long-term uh, target of reducing about another 50%, reducing greenhouse carbon emissions. They had a goal of uh, getting close to 100% reduction and, uh, and having a 100% certified portfolio. So they issued the first corporate green bond under the uh, ICMA's green bond principles back in 2014. And at that time, their framework was focused on, uh, the, on renewable energy and developing low carbon buildings. And that framework continued to evolve over time as they got more sophisticated in their practice and they 
did a first update to include retrofits to the existing uh, buildings in their portfolio to make them more energy efficient, sustainable, and issued bonds uh, to, to undertake those activities. And then they updated their uh, framework again to bring in a broader set of financing tools that they can use in their real estate business. The benefits that they derived from this is they developed a whole new class of investor base that was in sync with their environmental mission. They improved communications with the investors and, and they were able to tell their story and generate interest and in sustainability in the projects. And it enhanced the company culture by creating awareness across the culture of what their mission was and how the money that they were, that they were being entrusted by their investors were being used to support that. So, you know, in conclusion, these are, these are, the green bonds can play a very powerful role in, uh, in a real estate portfolio um, and, and, and in helping to drive efficiency and, and greening of both your existing portfolio as well as uh, moving forward with uh, low carbon zero you know, net energy or even positive energy buildings going forward. All right, and there's Greg's contact information. Thanks a ton, that was great. Um, keep the questions coming. If you go to the next slide, Kyle, we're going to do about 20 minutes of Q&A here. Um, we've seen a ton of great questions actually already. Um, and by far the most upvoted one is how do you anticipate financing options changing given the economic downturn? Um, Rachel, you touched on that a little bit. Edwin, I think you, you addressed it pretty comprehensively, but all three of you feel free to, to weigh in on how capital markets and financing options are going to likely shift as a result, not just of COVID-19, but of the resulting economics. I mean, I'll jump in and say that, I mean, I think that they're all going to continue to grow in importance, right? Um, as uh, cities and counties are looking for ways to, you know, help facilitate recovery, um, they're going to be looking at, at anything they can, right, to, to help building owners and uh, developers, whoever it might be. So, um, I, from a, a CPACE perspective, I certainly expect it to continue uh, to grow, given that it is private financing um, that could be made available uh, for folks on a more broad spectrum. So where we've seen some geographic limitations in CPACE, I'm, um, I'm hopeful that maybe this would be a good point where they could see that intersection um, of the, you know, fostering sustainable development while also finding a way to stimulate economic development uh, with CPACE financing. Great, uh, awesome. Uh, I have another one here. So this is for you, Edwin. You had a, we had a couple questions to kind of clarify the efficiency as a service structure. Um, one of them was when you do an efficiency as a service transaction and the building where the equipment's installed gets sold, what happens? Are there options to terminate the contract, move it to the new borrower, or sorry, the new building owner, et cetera? Yeah, it's a good question. And again, I was, I was uh, highlighting flexibility, right? Um, and and we, try, we try to do that as much as possible. Um, if, the, if it can be transferred, uh, we try to make sure it gets transferred to the next building owner. But if, if the next building owner doesn't want it, which a lot of the times they do want it, right? I think that can be a misconception sometimes because it's uh, uh, very, uh, uh, the, the added value is, is great, right? So, but if, if they don't want it, um, then we'll just put everything back uh, to the way it was, really. And there's some, there's some things that we do ahead of time with the initial building owner to make sure that we are able to technically and contractually uh, just take our equipment back and and uh, leave the building the way it was before we got involved. Got it. So you guys would retain ownership of the equipment, just take it back, redeploy it if possible. Yeah, there, there, are, other, there are other more complex things that can be done. And, and uh, I'd be happy to chat with anyone uh, offline about that. Awesome. Um, while we're on you, Edwin, we had another question here about uh, what are you seeing in efficiency as a service in the private sector versus public sector? Are you seeing state and local governments using it's the a, model as well? Yeah, that's a great question that, that you know, I've, I've been on calls with school districts and municipal governments. Um, the, the biggest difference is that the private sector uh, has less bureaucracy and re less regulations and can move quicker uh, for reasons related to their bottom line. 
unfortunately, the government uh, will sometimes try to put us under the performance con energy savings performance contracting regulations. Uh, there's states that have very, and municipalities that have very comprehensive regulations. And, and sometimes it's uh, difficult to navigate uh, and, and com even compete sometimes and just meet those requirements. So that's, I think, the biggest difference that uh, folks need to adapt uh, to the model a bit more on the public sector size. side, sir. Very good, thank you. Um, question for you, Rachel, that often comes up, um, and that is, you talked a little bit about how mortgage lenders are, are kind of collectively coming around to the idea of, of commercial pace, and in some cases actually originating pace loans, which is, a, which is an interesting sea change from where we were five years ago, right? Um, but I had a question here about, um, can you just generally, can you speak to the concerns that mortgage lenders have about default risk and the pace loan being senior to existing loans on the property, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a very popular question. Um, so I figured that was going to come up at some point, but, you know, don't want to go too much into the minutia, but because of the lien priority that pace takes, given that it is a voluntary special assessment, it's the same position as any other property tax or special assessment that a property owner would have. And so because of that, uh, we do have to get consent from the lenders and so they do ask questions. Um, but what are a couple of really important things to point out that I think a lot of folks don't realize um, about commercial paces that one, it cannot accelerate under any circumstance. So if we have a 25 year amortization um, on that loan or assessment, we will have that for 25 years. There's no way we can ever uh, call all of that due, unlike a, <clears throat> a traditional mortgage or other types of financing that folks may look at. And so because of that, it's really only that one year's PACE assessment, if it's ever past due, it's actually in front of the bank. And so typically when they can start to understand that piece of it and realize that it really has no impact to their rights or remedies on the project, um, it could also help improve the debt service, right? If it's replacing MES in a transaction, um, then it could actually be doing a lot of really good things within the capital stack, so long as it's, you know, sized correctly. And, you know, we'll work together to do that. So, you know, worst case, a lot of folks will uh, just, you know, they really should look at it as just an additional property tax that they're underwriting. And so in some cases, to get them comfortable, they may just decide to, you know, escrow a year's worth of uh, the PACE payments. And then at that point, they're, uh, they're pretty well covered. So happy to, if anybody has any follow-up questions to that, I'm happy to answer um, any additional questions offline. And then I'll also point out that uh, the CPACE Alliance put together a really good uh, white paper not too long ago that is specifically for mortgage lenders. And so I would uh, point anyone that has additional questions to that website and to take a look at that. It has some really good talking points uh, that you can use with your uh, with your lenders. Awesome. Yeah, and we and on the Better Buildings Financing Navigator, we link to, I believe, that resource and a number of other PACE research uh, resources. Um, while we're on the topic of PACE contracts, we had someone, several people ask, actually, what you mean by non-recourse financing, if you could just define that for folks. Yeah, it just means that the borrower is not personally liable um, for that. It's, it's really tied to uh, the collateral. Yeah, tied to the asset rather than the, yeah. the borrower. Got it. Um, okay, great. Uh, let's see, Greg, question for you. We had a couple questions about green bonds and their traction in the market. Uh, maybe you could do them both at the same time. One is, are you seeing more green bonds in certain regions than others and within the US or internationally? And does region matter, right, when it comes to green bonds? Like are there regulatory concerns or other things that, that influence where green bonds are the most successful? Second part of that question was, um, talking a little bit about the difference between corporate green bonds versus municipal green bonds and, and what, what kind of market activity we're seeing there. Um, so to go, uh, I mean, yes, so there, it, this, this concept really came out of Europe, but the U.S. is the leader um, and green was the leader in green bonds last year, uh, 50 billion of that, two, of that 250 billion. So, um, so I, I'm not sure the region really makes a difference now that, that the, that the, uh, Market is 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 um, accepting of these principles and accepting of these type of specified bonds. Um, as it relates to corporate versus municipal, um, I think you're going to see more. You're going to see 
more municipal bonds than using this. Uh, this just just because of uh, uh, you know, you, you're seeing more local jurisdictions uh, 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 stand up climate change, sustainability, resiliency plans. You know, and, and they need to have uh, they need to they need to have financing that's tied into the goals around those plans. And this is a logical path to do that and to cultivate uh, uh, in, investors beyond just the traditional muni buyers and bonds. Um, you know, that's a different marketplace. It's a tax exempt marketplace than, than private corporate. But but I think it, I think it's very deep, and um, and I think the green bonds are going to help help to drop to to drive adoption because of the ability to tie the financing to their plans. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Edwin, a couple questions about how efficiency as a service compares to traditional energy performance contracts or ESPCs. The first question was just talking more about what the difference is. And just to spice it up a little bit, we had one comment that said energy performance contracting is not dead, but ESAs are starting to become more popular. Please opine on that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, I actually agree. I was I was uh, act, uh, looking to the future when I said that. Um, the uh, what's the difference? Uh, I think the the biggest difference is uh, energy savings performance contracts are are focused again on uh, savings, and that's the performance element. But there's also ownership differences. Uh, you can have an energy savings performance contracting. It could be um on the balance sheet for the customer or, or the municipality or whoever. Uh, those, those I think are two, two major differences with efficiency as a service. You can have um, other performance elements. Uh, we do a lot of lumens as a service where folks do not care about the savings at all. I mean, they're getting those benefits, but they are contracting with us. So we increase the lumen levels throughout the entire building. So I think that's one of the, the how it's structured, uh, the biggest difference and yeah, uh, I think energy performance contracting set the paved the way for all of us, and it, it will it will continue. I was just trying to highlight how some folks are uh, our customers uh, are looking for different options. Uh, school district in North Carolina that we're working with said we don't want to do performance contracting anymore because we don't like the terms. So some of my experiences. Yeah, I would just add to that based on, you know, we, we at DOE have been trying to kind of taxonomize the energy services economy to make it easier to talk about because there is a lot of concern, like questions around what is energy performance contracting versus efficiency as a service versus ESAs, et cetera. Um, they're all kind of flavors of the same idea where a third party provides the service of energy savings and of managing your energy equipment. One way we often think about it that I think is helpful is think about it as a, as a, as a graph with two axes. One axis is the extent to which the performance is actually guaranteed, right? You can have like a very intensive traditional energy performance contract where a third party guarantees you energy savings and they, they manage it all and just tell you your utility bill will go down by X percent. All the way to very light touch forms of efficiency as a service where there's no savings guarantee at all. All that it's guaranteeing is that the equipment will continue operating. Right, and then you have a spectrum of project size, right? So traditional energy performance contracting tends to be very large. I mean, usually you won't see ESPC deals less than 500,000. Um, sometimes, and usually they're in the multi-millions, whereas efficiency as a service and some of the more recent products were more specifically designed for smaller scale, as small as you know, $10,000 in some cases, or even lower for a residential application. So that doesn't define it precisely, but those are two kind of axes you might want to think about the market on, and there's providers all over that, all over that graph, effectively. Um, Great, so I wanna talk, let's see here. There was a really good question in here. Um, Rachel, question for you. Uh, we talked about kind of enabling legislation at the, at the state level for PACE. What, what exactly does the process look like when, from when the enabling legislation is established to when actual PACE programs are, uh, are created? Because this person noted that, you know, there's, there's a lot more states that have enabling legislation that don't have the whole state covered with PACE programs. So kind of how right. That yeah, that's a good question too, but it, it really kind of depends on what that enabling legislation says. Most states um, have legislation that they pass, but then it has to be opted in at each of the local levels. And so Texas, for instance, right, um, you know, Harris County that covers Houston and then uh, the city of Dallas and then, uh, you know, 
Travis County that has Austin, right? All of those have had to opt in separately because, and I think the, the person who asked the question also pointed out because the tax assessor is going to be collecting uh, the taxes in many of these instances or the assessments. And so we have to get their approval to do that, right? Um, and so there's typically an ordinance that's passed um, at the local level for each of these to enable the PACE program. And then there's also some form of program administration that's set up. And in some cases that can be a statewide program administrator that really just serves as a function of uh, approving the projects, coordinating with the local governments and the lenders and the uh, property owners. And so uh, sometimes that's, again, statewide, sometimes it's uh, municipality by municipality. So it's, I wish I had one kind of peanut butter answer for how it worked everywhere, but uh, sometimes that can be uh, a little nuanced from place to place. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. That was a great answer. Um, one question here that I can take quickly. Somebody asked with the, uh, the Finance and Resilience Initiative and the, and the Resilience Roadmap that we developed, how applicable is that? Uh, Let's see, they asked uh, for city facilities, for some municipal government facilities. Um, in order, you know, resilience is a huge issue. So we focused the initial round of the work we did on finance and resilience, specifically on commercial buildings from the perspective of the owner. But I'd say 80% of the content in that, in that resilience roadmap is still applicable to any, any owner of a commercial building, whether you're in the commercial real estate sector or not. Uh, even occupants of commercial buildings, I think would find it useful. That said, we are in the market for new work to be done on finance and resilience. One of the things we're thinking about doing over the next year, kind of discussing with the market is, are, is there other guidance or, or resources or case studies or other uh, materials that we could help create to kind of demystify resilience for specific sectors or specific issues within resilience? So if you have ideas uh, to that effect, which I, it sounds like you do from your question, uh, please shoot me an email and I'd love to talk more about how we could improve that resource. Um, one final question, uh, I guess for Greg and others too, if you have thoughts on this, but when it comes to green bonds, um, the, the green bond principles feel kind of voluntary, right? Uh, there's, not, there's not a regulatory body that, if, that effectively says what is and is not a green bond. So do we have issues with varying qualities? Like if you're an investor in green bonds, um, how, how can you sort of do a set of checks to make sure that your money's actually being used for the purposes that you that you hope it is. So that's the whole purpose of having an external review. You know, approximately uh, three quarters to 80% of the bond of the green bonds that are issued are reviewed externally so that there's a third party that the investor can rely on uh, to assure that these principles are being met, that the issuer does have a sustainability framework against which this project is being approved and the projects in furtherance of that proceeds are being used for it. And, and then is being measured. So, you know, I think that's your, that's, that's what the, the, the truly uh, uh, committed investors want to see, is they want to see some form of external review. And then you have the even higher standard like the climate, climate bonds, which um, are even a more rigorous framework um, of, and, and they require certification. And, and so, so that's, that's where the market's evolving. Um, you know, if I were an investor and somebody just came to me and said, you know, this is a green bond um, and they didn't have an opinion, I, you know, unless I knew the issue very well and I knew their story, I'd be skeptical. Got it. That's great. Thank you. Uh, well, we have a bunch more, but I think we need to wrap up here um, so we can close out. So Kyle, if you want to uh, go to the next slide here. Um, just a couple final notes at the end. We want to invite you all to attend the Better Buildings webinar series uh, in July, starting in July. Partners are going to be discussing some of the most pressing topics uh, that you all are facing and talking about practices and, and innovative ways to approach sustainability and energy performance. So if you want to register for any or all of these, go to the Better Buildings Solutions Center and click on the 2019-2020 webinar series. Um, go to the next slide. Uh, I also want to highlight the Better Building Solutions Center, which has over 2,800 solutions, including all the case studies and the navigator and the roadmap and all the stuff we talked about today to help you find proven and cost-effective uh, energy and water efficiency solutions. So we have a, a cool video to show you, if we can just briefly show you that now.
All right, thanks. Yeah, you know how uh, when internet forums became a thing back in the 90s and everybody would, uh, somebody would come on and ask a new question that somebody else had already asked and there would always be those, the cranky folks that would sort of descend on them explaining how they needed to search before asking the question. Uh, we're not cranky about it, but it, in a similar vein, there's, if you have a question about energy efficiency or a type of project or a policy or any co finance concept, chances are it has been addressed on, in some case study or fact sheet on the Solutions Center. It's truly an incredible uh, gathering of resources that's growing every day thanks to our partners. So highly encourage you guys to check that out. And if we move to the last slide, um, I just wanna thank our panelists one last time. This is a really good discussion. I, th I think we probably get gone for another hour uh, discussing these topics, but I think we, we gave folks a good overview. So thank you all for being a part of it. Um, if you wanna learn more about anything we discussed today, contact any of us directly, including myself, Joe Invic there at the bottom. Um, and with that, we will tell you all to have a, have a great evening. <laughs>